Hi, it's Dark Centeno, and <clears throat> thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to be talking about, finally, after uh, a number of different shows where I didn't get around to this topic, talking about uh, what to do to prepare <clears throat> for a telemedicine visit uh, for CCI, PICL procedure, um, or just a general telemedicine visit that you might have. Um, what are the things that we're looking for? Uh, what kind of things might you want to consider prior to that telemedicine uh, visit? So again, today I'm going to talk about uh, what to do to prep for a telemedicine visit and finally get into this topic after a pretty long time. Obviously, um, you know, I was down in Caymans and that kind of interrupted things. And then uh, we had uh, some other things get in the way. So we'll finally talk about this today. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen. As usual, you can ask questions about this. You can ask questions about anything you want to as well. So let me share my screen here. It looks like that went and worked. And I'm going to go ahead and get this going here. Okay, so what happens in a telemedicine visit for uh, the PICL procedure, CCI, and in general, just in telemedicine visits in, uh, in general, because those still happen for all sorts of things, problems uh, with low back pain, problems with knees, shoulders, ankles, etc. So we offer a telemedicine visit in this case for patients who believe they may have CCI, and I want to determine if they're a candidate for the PICL procedure or anything else we offer. Um, now, it's important to realize uh, what the purpose of this visit is. So the first purpose would be determining whether or not you have CCI and looking at that information, and then what would be the most appropriate non-surgical treatment if that's available to you. So how does all this work? Well, here are the steps. You upload uh, your imaging and records that you want the doctor to review. Uh, you're responsible for uploading all of that. So uh, obviously, and that's going to be, uh, we're moving to just using a simple uh, box or Dropbox type folder because a lot of people have used those for work. Um, so you're responsible for making sure that's all there. Um, obviously, if it doesn't get there, the doctor won't be able to review it. If it does get there, the doctor will be able to review it. Um, <clears throat> you then fill out a CCI questionnaire. Then a time is scheduled to meet with the doctor over Zoom to review all the images, records, the CCI questionnaire, as well as active question and answer. So the doctor can get deeper into what's going on. And then a determination will be made as to whether you meet our criteria for having CCI, which may be very, very different than the criteria that uh, have already been applied from a surgical standpoint, and whether or not you're a candidate for the PICL or another type of procedure that we offer, or whether the doctor just thinks, you know, surgery is the right answer here, or you're not a candidate for anything we offer more likely than not. So, you know, the first thing is uploading your images and your records. You're responsible for making sure all of that gets uploaded, number one. Um, and uh, if it's not in your upload file, obviously reviewing it is going to be pretty hard to do. Most important studies for us to make a diagnosis listed in order here. As I always say, digital motion x-ray is uh, the first one we look at because there are published norms there and there's a rate of accuracy published for identifying CCI that's traumatically based at least using DMX. Um, the next most important one would be an upright MRI reflection extension. Next most important one, a routine supine neck MRI, cervical flexion extension x-rays, and less critical for our purposes, but we're happy to review them, CTAs, CTVs, MRAs. Uh, and that's because it's rare that having that information changes the game plan, whereas it's much more common that having a DMX will change the game plan. 
So again, um, I can get information from all of these things and I'm just listing them in the order of the likelihood they, uh, that they represent to us that if CCI is present, we're going to be able to make that call during a telemedicine evaluation. So a word on imaging. Um, again, uh, and I've said this a lot, our focus is on imaging types with validation in this patient population. So what does that mean? What is validation? Um, there are studies on CCI patients who do not require immediate uh, emergency surgery. Um, these studies are blinded reader type, meaning that the readers had no idea which patients had the problem and didn't have the diagnosis. And the study generates measurements that correctly classify patients based on that measurement. Uh, so for example, for DMX overhang, if it's more than four millimeters and there's asymmetry of the dens in the atlas, we know that there's a 95% chance that if a blinded reader tries to put normal patients and those kinds of patients in a box, 95% chance that they'll get that classification right. It's critical though to understand that for the other types of measurements that we have, grab oak, CXA, BDI, BAI, uh, all of those measurements do not have this kind of research to be able to support uh, that they're valid in correctly classifying CCI patients that don't require emergency surgery. In fact, those measurements come from a literature base where people got into a serious traumatic, let's say, car accident and their head's falling off and therefore they need emergency surgery to fix that. Um, we don't have measurements of this patient population and we certainly don't have blinded reader studies and we certainly don't have measurements where we know if it's over this, we can correctly classify someone in the normal box versus the CCI box. So realize that that's how we view this, which is quite different from how many of the surgeons who are used to using these measurements that have not been validated in this patient population, how they view this. So next would be filling out a CCI questionnaire. We have an extensive questionnaire that you can fill out in a PDF format. Uh, its focus is on CCI symptoms, your history, your response to treatments, other diagnoses. Um, and then we complete this questionnaire with your information as we go. And then uh, we'll render an initial diagnosis during the telemedicine. Obviously that may change once we do a hands-on exam. And then finally, there's a determination of whether you meet our criteria for having CCI and are a candidate for PICL or something else. Um, and there's only a couple options there, right? Number one is not a candidate for anything we do. Number two is you are a candidate for something we do and, and here's what that is. And number three would be, uh, we think everything is too severe. We would recommend just seeing a surgeon. So a word on CCI diagnosis. Um, and you may find that you've been given a CCI diagnosis by a neurosurgeon that specializes in this area, but because we use different criteria to make that diagnosis, you may not be a candidate for the PICL procedure. So as I always say, we look at the complaints that match CCI, imaging that shows CCI, uh, response to treatment is consistent with CCI, and a physical exam, obviously that occurs in the office, uh, that matches CCI. So important to understand that just because you have a certain thing on your imaging to us doesn't mean you have CCI. We've got to look at checking all four of these boxes to get there. Um, and then finally, a meeting with the doctor over Zoom to review all the images, records, CCI questionnaire, as well as Q&A. So this is done over Zoom. Uh, if you don't use Zoom regularly, <coughs> please make sure you take the time to get acquainted with that platform. It's not real complex, obviously it's used, <coughs> excuse me, every day in the business world. Uh, we're gonna require your CCI questionnaire. We're gonna review your CCI questionnaire, your history, imaging, all of that good stuff. 
and then I'll also generally make other care recommendations. Even if you're not a candidate for our procedure, I may tell you to do curve restoration based on what I see, or I might tell tell you that you've never seen a NUCA chiropractor or an AO chiropractor, and that this may be a good idea. Uh, <coughs> But one of the things I want to really point out is that the purpose of this visit is not a second opinion on your surgical options. We recently had a patient who was very upset that uh, he felt that we didn't look at all of the uh, thousands and thousands of images he had submitted as to whether or not uh, he was a surgical candidate because he'd been, he'd been told he was a surgical candidate. Um, now, if I feel you need surgery, I'm happy to say that. Having said that, um, the purpose <coughs> of something like this is not to opine uh, or agree or disagree with what your surgeon has told you. Um, the focus here is to see if you meet the criteria for what it is we do. Obviously, anything else I can tell you, I'm happy to. Um, but at some point we're going to draw that line between, okay, well, that guy told you you needed surgery. This is what I think. So let's go to questions here, um, on that. Let me stop my sharing. And we'll go to whatever questions we have. Okay, I understand I have Eagle syndrome on the right side. When I'm out of alignment, I get worse in feeling of bone in the throat. When I swallow, I feel like a literal pull of my neck and jaw to the right, like a bone is moving around the C3 level. My upper spine head literally bobbles. Seconds later, bobble head feels like something is catching. What can a calcified style of hyaloid ligament get caught on? Um, well, again, so Eagle syndrome is critical to understand, meaning that if you've determined you have Eagle syndrome based on imaging, the problem is there's a lot of people walking around out there that have no symptoms at all that would have the same exact imaging. So that's so that's one of the things I think that's very critical to understand as a patient, right? Just because you have something on an image doesn't mean that that thing is causing your symptoms or that thing is even abnormal. So uh, when it comes to Eagle syndrome and calcified stylohyoid ligaments, um, we've got a large percent of the population walking around who have no problems at all, who have that on their imaging. So when you say you've got Eagle syndrome, there, there would have to be a lot more to get to that diagnosis than just a picture. It would have to be, let's say, hands-on physical exam or a block of the glossopharyngeal nerve right here that takes away your throat pain, etc. So I wouldn't put you in the Eagle syndrome category solely based on a calcified style of hyoid ligament because a lot of people walking around out there who have never had a day of problems in their whole life have the identical image you've got. So that's that's the hard part here in trying to help answer that question. Regenic Stacy Coffin, why is actually current recommendation for time span between posterior PRP injections uh, three months, four months? Or what is Dr. Current C's Dr. C's? Uh, no, generally for posterior injections, we see responses much sooner in the four to six week time frame. Uh, Pia, what structures are typically damaged in cranial, cranial settling? Now, cranial settling is a surgical concept, one that we don't have much face validity on at this point um, in this patient population. So that's a hard uh, question to answer. Um, because we don't have research in this patient population that allows us to put people in two boxes, one that have cranial settling and the other ones that don't at all or, or have similar images, but no symptoms. Meaning trying to classify somebody based on their cranial settling as sick or well hasn't been done, uh, at least not to my knowledge. So uh, tough to say because that's not a diagnosis I would tend to use uh, unless there's something that would require emergency surgery. So in that case, the skull is so low that it's pushing right up against the brainstem. And we know that that just occurred. 
And we know that that just started causing brainstem-like symptoms. Hi, Dr. Centeno, sorry to ask this here. I had a previous static x-ray that showed overhang, though like this may be to be more if I went into full range of motion. Recent imaging by Dr. Rosa showed three degree lesions of ALR bilaterally. I posted her CXA. Uh, yeah, you still need a DMX. Uh, so uh, that's what we use to help correctly classify you um, from our standpoint. So still, still need a DMX. Uh, Diana, I feel like I've never properly had my ADI assessed in my previous x-rays. I was fainting in flexion. So I stayed neutral then was deemed normal. I do have grade three lesions. Yeah, just be careful about that grading scale because the grading scale you're referring to was put forward by Crokinus using a 1.5 Tesla magnet that was a closed bore image and not an open um, MRI. So we don't have a similar grading scale that fits with an open MRI that's been published on. Um, so uh, what that means in the context of injury is unknown at this point when we're using that type of open upright MRI because all of that data that you're referring back to, the Crokinus data set, um, was put together in Norway using a 1.5 uh, Tesla closed bore magnet with the person lying face up. I'm in advance by Fachin. Uh, why some lower body issues like lumbar pain and frequent urination are also reported as soon as CCI by patients in that image on Regenex blog, how is the relation to CCI? Um, so anytime you've got lower back issues, you can have frequent urination. That's a super, super common complaint of people that have chronic low back pain. So of all the patients I see in my clinic who have chronic low back pain, if you ask them that question, probably about 20% to 30% will, will tell you that they've got uh, urinary frequency uh, that seems to be correlated with their back pain, meaning that when their back pain is worse, they'll get urinary frequency um, or urinary urges. Um, and that occurs due to irritation of the sacral nerves. Now, that's to be separated out from very severe issues with um, the urinary system, which can happen if there's compression of like the conus medullaris, where someone can't hold their uh, urination. Um, and when I mean someone, I don't mean uh, women as they age, because many women as they age without any issues, obviously get urinary dribbling. That just happens to the to the relaxation of the pelvic floor. Now to answer your question, how problems with the low back where urinary uh, frequency is common, correlate with the neck, even in patients who don't have CCI, we see lots and lots of people who have chronic neck pain develop back pain. And the current theory is that uh, having chronic neck pain causes the stabilizers in the low back to go offline. And then as people start to develop low back pain, there's a percentage of them that will get urinary frequency as part of that due to irritation of the sacral nerves. Uh, again, by fashion, um, should vascular and vestibular causes excluded before cranial circulation considered to cause of someone's neurological symptoms? Uh, well, certainly vestibular causes, if there's dizziness, should be excluded. So the good way to do that is to see an ENT physician. ENT physicians are good at looking at any problems in the inner ear that may relate to that. Now, as far as vascular goes, that's a huge, huge box. So I'm not quite sure what you mean there. You may want to, to clarify that one a little bit uh, because that's a big, big box in which to answer that question. Uh, it's been advanced by Thatchen. Uh, I got that one already. Let's see. Thatchen, again, the muscle atrophy in the neck is more due to the muscles being overloaded from doing the job with ligaments of shutting off or more from use of collar. Um, yeah, Fatshem, we don't fully understand right now why the muscle atrophy in the neck occurs. There's some great research in that regard by Jim Elliott. Uh, Jim Elliott is actually one of our old physical therapists who then went through the PhD track and is now working in academia, I believe, at Northwestern University in Chicago. Um, so no one's 100% sure. One theory is that it's because of overload of the muscles. Another would be that something gets injured 
Um, and there's even some research that there's some brain correlates and it may not be injury to the brain. It just may be the brain's response to muscle atrophy. Um, but we certainly know that using a collar will cause more diffuse muscle atrophy. So the muscle atrophy in the neck we're talking about that would be due to CCI's more specific upper cervical. Obviously, if you wear a collar for a long period of time, you're going to get more diffuse atrophy at multiple levels. Um, in the neck, not just upper cervical. Stacy, in case my question advanced didn't make any time, where's your current rec? I got that. Uh, submitted advanced by Fatchin. Uh, what do you check for during physical exam for a procedure for cervical instability? Yeah, the first thing we're trying to do is to make sure that the exam localizes to the upper cervical spine, meaning that we're talking about an upper cervical problem. So the exam should focus there. And what I mean by that is the person is tender and the upper cervical facets, the um, nerves at the back of the skull are irritated. Um, you know, there's, uh, there isn't, for instance, so for example, we, we commonly will see patients with a lower cervical disc bulge and CCI or rule out CCI. So that exam would look very different. Let's say numbness at C6 in their hand and specific things around that C5, 6 level than someone with a high upper cervical issue. So that's our goal during a hands-on exam is to make sure it all makes sense and fits with that diagnosis and not another diagnosis. Liam, any idea of how daily prolonged exposure to poorly ventilated air could affect the healing outcomes of PICL? My home is generally around 60 parts of sick workplace or other. Uh, yeah, I don't have any idea, Liam. Um, not sure I'd focus my time and energy worrying about that kind of thing, meaning at the end of the day, it's probably not impacting your healing uh, to any substantial degree. Um, and there's so many other things that you can control, like uh, diet, exercise, um, et cetera. Um, that I'm not quite so sure that this is something I'd focus on. Uh, Stephen, hello, Dr. Santino. Since recently I've gotten a noise in both ears, which is also dependent on how I move my head. A lot of this is when I'm looking down and say what is happening or where it comes from. It should be better. With... And could that be better with samples? And again, are there reports? Um, so certainly crepitus in the neck is pretty common with any kind of neck issues. So degenerative disc disease in the neck causes cracking and popping or crepitus as you move. That's obviously going to be worse in certain circumstances and better in others. Um, and uh, so it also could be related to instability too, meaning that extra motion could be perceived as noise in both of your ears. Uh, a lot would depend on the kind of noise. Um, so maybe tell me more about the kind of noise and that may give me a little bit more info. Yes, I agree about Eagle syndrome. Thank you. I'm trying to understand why and when my Alice is out, I get a foreign body sensation in my throat. Yeah, I think we talked about that, Diana, last time is, is that could be. So now we're talking about CCI and its relationship to a hard stop there, uh, which is something different. Um, and that could irritate cranial nerve nine, which could give you that sensation in the throat. Uh, Megan Bender uh, would having a scalenectomy to relieve symptoms of thoracic out syndrome further. So I was, yeah, that would be a really bad idea. Um, hard to come up with a worse idea than that one. Um, and what I mean by that is that the scalenes act as the, the guy wires of the mast of the cervical spine. So if you start cutting scalenes, then you're going to definitely destabilize the neck and then end up with a bunch of new problems related to increased cervical instability. So uh, that would certainly be the very last thing you would consider doing um, if you had CCI. Now, who knows, maybe it needs to be done, but the it's the last thing on the list you would ever do because if you put that right up front, or even the middle of your treatment plan, um, you're highly likely to make things much, much worse. Uh, Dana, have you seen patients with grade three lesions looking but okay with overhangs on their DMX? Um, again, Dana, grade three lesions um, were validated 
on a different kind of MRI than the one you had. So I, I, that's impossible to answer that question. Now, if you mean uh, grade three lesions and a 1.5 Tesla closed bore magnet, like the one that Crokinus used, um, is there a relationship between that and overhang? Yeah, I think there's a reasonable relationship between that and overhang, but it's not a 100% relationship at all, meaning that you got to realize that, that we're looking at ligaments on MRI. Sometimes they can look abnormal, uh, but they're totally fine. They function just fine and normal. So there isn't 100% correlation at all between anything we see on an MRI about the structure of how a ligament uh, looks with regard to its density, which is what we're talking about here, and how that ligament functions in real life on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Miguel, is it possible make your procedure living in Europe with uh, chronic cervical pain of three years, uh, did a lot of physical therapy, cervical, two radio frequencies, um, Miguel, we would need to know what problem you have. So we would need to do a telemedicine evaluation. We, we would need to look at your MRIs, talk to you about all the issues that you have. Regrettably, radio frequency will increase instability. So if you have instability and you had radio frequency done, then that regrettably goes the opposite direction of the direction we're trying to head, right? We're trying to make things more stable. And if we do a radio frequency procedure, we burn the nerves that go to the muscles that stabilize. So they've got no innervation, so they then can't do their job. And we end up uh, dramatically increasing the instability. Uh, Megan uh, Marklet, is CCI more common in men or women? How long would it be safe to wait uh, to diagnosis and treatment? Do you require being diagnosed by you or does a prior di diagnosis accept it? Um, so in my, well, I don't think anyone knows the answer in this patient population. In my experience, it's more common in women than in men. Uh, and um, as far as waiting is concerned, a lot depends on how the patient is progressing, right? If the person is not real disabled and seems to be kind of the same or slowly getting better, then I think you can wait. Uh, if the person is rapidly descending into increasing disability, then I think it's a bad idea to wait because the longer that person is not active and more disabled, the more likely it is that we're going to be in a situation where we're treating two problems, right? One is the instability and the other is all the muscle atrophy caused by the lack of activity. So it just depends on the patient's uh, progression. Are they progressing rapidly towards disability or does it seem to be just kind of fine? They're dealing with it and it's not that big a deal uh, functionally. And those are two completely different clinical scenarios. Uh, when swallowing, is it possible for the base of the tongue hyo to somehow move the cervical spine? I'm trying so hard to understand anatomically. Um, yeah, that is, I think we talked about um, some of these ligaments that we're discussing connect into the hyoid bone and the hyoid bone connects into the jaw. So there'd be some pulling on the jaw. Now, cranial nerve nine can be impacted by CCI. Also cranial nerve 12, which would be the tongue in our experience can be impacted by CCI. Um, so there may be some motion happening or there may just be irritated nerves that feels like motion. Uh, Dan, uh, at upright MRI, grade three, DMX cats only showed some laxity, but not much on ALAR. I think I, I did move my neck as much as far as possible. Uh, uh, Dana, it was, uh, uh, irritation cranial nerve nine. Um, so that can cause certainly a sensation at the back of the throat. Uh, tongue issues would usually be cranial nerve 12. And that's another cranial nerve irritation that we commonly see in the CCI population. And I think I talked about that one. If you go back to the video that talks about uh, the new cervical plexus in the neck, it kind of ties together 9 and 12. Or the newly discovered. It's been there for obviously a long time. Uh, Ulysses, uh, I have a question. Does SI joint dysfunction cause a leg short and curve in the spine to the left? Um. SI joint dysfunction can cause one ilium to rotate forward and the other one backwards. That ilial rotation can lead 
to the sacrum getting turned, which can lead to some scoliosis in the spine. So uh, that's possible. Um, and obviously the, the treatment for that is usually getting rid of the, <coughs> excuse me, SI joint instability. So it doesn't rotate anymore. Uh, let's see what's the difference between a blind injection, ultrasound guide injections. Yeah, so uh, a blind injection means that the doctor doesn't really know where the needle is. Now, if we're injecting extremely superficial structures that are easy to palpate, so let's say, you know, this uh, elbow area for the lateral epicondyle. Uh, you can do a better job with ultrasound, but it can also be done reasonably efficiently without using ultrasound or blind. But let's go right back to your issue, SI joint. Um, SI joint, um, if you do it blind, you're going to miss those ligaments, um, depending on the body habitus of the patient, uh, probably about one in three times. Um, so you're not going to accurately inject ligaments. That um, number goes up as the patient is heavier. So if you're talking about a thin patient who's normal weight, then you can be more accurate if you're blind. Um, if you're talking about a patient that has any weight on them, so let's say a patient that's 50 pounds overweight, so let's say someone who is my height, 5'9 or 5'10, but weighs 260 pounds. Now you're struggling to be able to do it blind and the miss rate goes up. We add more weight, the miss rate goes up. So uh, in 2022, there's really no rationale or reason not to use ultrasound. Uh, these units are cheap. The courses to show how to do this are plentiful. Um, so there's just no rationale to do a blind injection um, in 2022. Um, there may have been in 2012 because the units are more expensive. There wasn't as much education, et cetera but just no excuse right now. And in my opinion, it's below the standard of care. Uh, Harry Winston, are there any supplements that you would get us through until we get treatment for CCI or specific things to avoid? You know, Harry, uh, anti-inflammatory supplements are probably your best bet. So th uh, in that class are gonna be things like fish oil, um, th high quality fish oil, things like uh, glucosamine, chondroitin, uh, turmeric, curcumin, uh, those sorts of things. Thatching, can you create an audio version of CCI ebooks? Those of us who are not functional can listen to it. Um, you know, Thatching, I haven't considered doing that. That's probably a good idea. I haven't gotten around to it yet. I'm not quite sure how long it would take to record that, but uh, probably a good idea. Thank you for that, that information. Uh, Ulysses, uh, does being on the phone a lot cause CCI or upper cervical instability? Unlikely that being on the phone a lot causes... Uh, upper cervical instability. Uh, why does every time I turn my head, I get a rapid heart rate? Um, yeah, so that's something to certainly get investigated. The first investigation should be by cardiology, trying to make sure that you don't have something that's imminently treatable and correctable from a, a heart standpoint. Obviously, if they give you a clean bill of health and they throw up their hands, we don't know what's going on. Then you can start to look at whether or not you're getting irritation of the vagus nerve in your neck. Realize that the vagus nerve is the brakes on the heart. So if that nerve gets irritated by CCI, then the brakes come off the heart and you get a, a rapid heart rate. But again, get checked out first by the heart experts before we start looking at that. Let's see, I'm 19 suffering all these symptoms, neck, back, SI joint, no one believing me. Um, well, certainly lots of patients out there that are your age that have these issues. Um, sounds like you just need to get to a doctor that, that specializes in this kind of stuff. Uh, Pia, what kind of symptoms do you usually see from the tongue when the nerve is irritated? You know, the biggest thing I think we see is either pain or numbness in the tongue. Um, sometimes we'll see spasms in the tongue. Um, I've had one or two patients through the years that have very bizarre spasms in the tongue with changes of head and neck position. Um, so that's sort of the spectrum of the kind of things we see. 
Uh, Diana, do you have any advice for anxiety? I feel it's become anxious person, scared to move my neck a lot, scared to walk, even though it's okay. Um, yeah, Dan, I wouldn't have those worries. I don't think you're going to tear the rest of the ALR transverse ligament by just normal daily activities. Um, now, certainly there can be irritation of the vagus nerve, as we, as we talked about, and that can lead to anxiety-like symptoms itself. But I think you also have to work on just your, your, your own response to all these things and realizing what's rational and what's not rational. So maybe finding a really good therapist who can help you separate the rational from the irrational uh, might be very uh, helpful for you. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you're going to get better quicker with treatment if you don't overreact, right? One of the things that we see as doctors is that um, we've got patients that don't react enough and should, We've got patients that overreact. And on the overreaction side, those patients generally um, uh, tend to get more unnecessary care. They tend to uh, pull the trigger impulsively on um, things they probably shouldn't be doing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And they also end up a bit more disabled because they're afraid of certain motions causing problems. And it's not logical to assume that those problems would happen. So I, I think getting with a really good therapist who you trust might be a good uh, step. And then also realizing that some of this could be coming from just irritation of the vagus nerve, but you're still gonna have to be able to figure out what's rational and not rational. But let's say I went to a different cardiology doctors and did every test that could find no cause. Yeah, so then I think uh, it's pretty reasonable to start working it up to see if it's coming from your neck. So that would be uh, getting with a CCI specialist and trying to see if it looks like your neck is the cause of this um, and or there's some other uh, evidence that you have CCI and this is just one of the side effects of that CCI. Uh, Kimberly, I know uh, this will not directly help CCI, but I know you have knowledge of regenerative medicine. So many places that offer IVs and NAD IVs. Do you have any opinion about this? They are often marketed as regenerative medicine. Yeah, so peptide IVs and NAD IVs. NAD, just so you know, is about to be pulled off the market by FDA. They're issuing warning letters right now, so that's going to go away. Um, not that we know that NAD is effective at all, uh, but that, that for whatever reason, the FDA has decided to classify it as a prescription drug rather than a supplement. Um, uh, peptide IVs, you know, same problem, right? We don't, so take, for example, BPC-157. We've got no human clinical data on BPC-157 for ligament or tendon healing, despite the fact that it's being used for that purpose. Um, so uh, would I pay money to have someone give me a peptide IV or an AD IV right now? No, I wouldn't. Would I pay money for my son or daughter to get that treatment right now? No, I wouldn't. Um, primarily because of what I know and primarily because uh, there are much more effective ways usually to treat the problem than starting an IV in somebody. Um, and that's simply because many of the areas we're trying to heal have poor blood supply. So uh, trying to get from the blood supply out here to where it is you're supposed to be healed is pretty, pretty tough in many of these cases. That only takes a direct injection into the spot. So no, I, I wouldn't do that for myself. And so I'm definitely not recommending it for my patients if I wouldn't do it in myself. Uh, Robert, how long do platelets injection to facet take to clear out? Um, you know, platelets have a normal lifespan. So once they're activated, uh, they start getting rid of their alpha vesicles and other things within the platelet through emission of, of vesicles. Um, and by day seven to 10, they're pretty much done with that. And they're going to be digested by macrophages, et cetera. So, uh, not more than a week or two. Listen, the reason I asked about being on my phone caused all these symptoms. There's information. Shell hunching down the phone too much will cause loose ligaments. Um, yeah, I don't know about loose ligaments, but I think what you're talking about is if you have and develop a forward head posture, and especially these days, because we all do this with our phones, right? Um, you're going to put more pressure on certain ligaments, 
which can get stretched out or worn out, uh, more aptly said, meaning the wear and tear on the ligaments exceeds your ability to repair them. Stacy, when laying down, my C-spine symptoms get worse if neck supported on any pillow, but I feel some relief if head is on a pillow, but nothing supporting my neck. But it is bad not having neck support. Um, probably not. If you can't tolerate neck support, you can't tolerate it, and that's okay. Elisi, why do these regen doctors charge patients a lot of money for these injections? Not sure which injections we're talking about or which doctors we're talking about. So maybe give me more information there. Um, I will give you an example of stuff I think is ridiculous. Um, Dr. Heise from my clinic just had a patient who was charged upwards of $40,000 for, for basically IV, quote, exosomes. Um, to treat a severe structural low back problem. Obviously, $40,000 later, the low back problem hasn't changed at all. You know, patient seeing Dr. Heise to get that directly treated, but that was a total waste of money, $40,000 for IV exosomes to try to treat a structural low back problem. Uh, Robert, when you inject PAOM, myodural bridge, is a particular single spot or multiple sites of... So PAOM requires... Um, uh, or usually requires uh, fluoroscopy plus contrast to make sure we're in that layer. The myodural bridge um, usually requires the same, but it's a different spot. And or there are sometimes you can see it clearly under ultrasound. Um, so it's, it's multiple different spots. Uh, Diana, have you treated many healthcare workers, doctors uh, with PICL and PRP who regained function and work full time again? Yes, this because such a physical job on the go. Um, we generally don't do PICL with PRP, but we do it with bone marrow concentrate. Um, yeah, it's kind of funny. I think both of, well, I don't know if either of these doctors want me to talk about their problems. So I won't give any names, but we just treated two doctors uh, who had this problem. It was fairly acute, meaning that they both knew I could point to where this happened within the last six months to a year. Um, they both got almost 100% improvement after the first procedure, so they were one and dones. Um, so yeah, we just treated two in the last two months. Um, well, I'm gonna say three months. Um, and, and they both did very, very well. So yes, we do treat healthcare workers who have this issue. There was a third guy who was gonna come out Ultimately, he kind of got better uh, from doing some different things. So he decided to, to not do it. We'll see if we ever see him. I, I don't know. Sheila, can CC happen from concussion? Hit ice, knocked over while skiing. Uh, it doesn't seem to significant enough with whiplash. Type injury, about four years of being treated for POTS, only getting worse. You send for root POTS specialist with CCI. Yeah, certainly. I mean, that's the pretty classic mechanism, right? You're in a situation where the head gets struck by something. So it might get struck by the ground or or you fall and, and your head hits the ground. Or, you know, we've had people with speakers that have fallen on their head or people in rear end crashes where they're in a pickup truck and the glass is right here and their head hits the glass um, or their head hits the, the B pillar, all that good stuff. Chiropract uh, fashion, chiropractic manipulation is associated with vascular dissection, stroke, epidural hematoma, da, 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 da. Um, How is the atlanta axis dislocation evaluated on images? Um, can chiropractic manipulation, I think what you're talking about is a long lever, turn the head kind of manipulation. So is it possible that that can cause usually vertebral artery dissection? It is but that would be extremely rare. So uh, those numbers would be far, far less than the number of people who die, for example, from taking Motrin. The death rate from taking Motrin for more than 90 days is one in 1200 based on a study by Moore et al. Um, so uh, what we're talking about here, while it happens is far, far, um, far, far less common than dying from taking prescription or not prescription, uh, off the shelf Advil for 90 days. So I think you have to put all of that in context to understand those risks. Uh, Ulysses, can I go to local prolotherapy doctor versus pain management? Um, if you've got upper cervical instability, um, it's usually not amenable 
to simple neck prolotherapy. Um, now, there are certain kinds that occur in flexion uh, that involve uh, laxity of these ligaments back here that might respond. But in our experience, only about one in five patients with CCI fall into that category. Um, as far as pain management, I don't think you need pain management. You need a doctor that specializes in CCI, and those are going to be few and, and far between. Your, your average pain management doctor is not going to know which end is up when it comes to that. Lissy, does PRF work better than PRP for cervical spine or other parts of the body? If you mean platelet-rich fibrin, platelet-rich fibrin is used surgically because it's a clot. So it's not going to be injected. Uh, <coughs> or maybe you mean pulse radio frequency. Let me know if you do. Ulysses, I have loose ligaments with lots of muscle spasms in the neck and back. Does it affect the bit? Gotcha. Sharon, uh, thanks for answering questions. Can the lower neck usually cause CCI if it's locked up, for example? Not usually, no. Uh, but we certainly see a lot of CCI patients who have lower neck problems. Now realize that by the time you get to 40 or 50 years age of age, let's say 50, about half of us have lower neck problems on neck MRIs, whether or not we've ever had a day of, of serious neck pain in our lives. So um, it would make sense that in our older patients with CCI, a lot of them have lower neck issues. Robert, back to plate lifespan. If 10 days, how much time does one notice if it's helping? You know, the, for the average high-dose PRP injection in a joint, so let's just isolate a joint, whether it's a facet joint or a wrist joint or wrist joints or a knee joint. Uh, so let's go with knees because those are something we can say um, there's just knee pain related to what's going on inside the knee. Uh, whereas in the neck, you know, lots and lots of things can cause problems, irritated nerves, facets, instability, et cetera. So if we just focus on the knee, how long does it take for a PRP injection to help a joint like the knee? I would say that the average person is not going to feel relief until, and I'm talking about the average middle-aged person um, or early elderly person, maybe where I am, I'm not quite sure where I am right now. Um, I would say we're talking at least uh, two to four weeks to get to the maximum effect somewhere in that time frame. Pia, can CCI cause any leg foot issues? Uh, Pia, we certainly see patients with CCI who then develop low back issues, who then develop issues in their, their leg and foot um, because of recruitment problems with the muscles down there. We can also see CC, CCI itself produce bad proprioception or position sense, which can impact how the foot hits the ground. So yes, that's certainly possible and, and we've seen that. Dana, how difficult was it for you to carve the CCI path as a doctor? Would doctor working CCI like you do as a physiatrist do the best special to go into? Um, you know, I got into this in a backwards kind of way, which I think I describe in that book. And that is that when I was a young doctor right out of residency, so I was in my late 20s, um, I met a local audiologist who was convinced that uh, many of the ENG evaluations that he was doing for in ear problems, uh, by looking at the raw data, which was something unusual even at the time, because at the time there were ENG machines that would interpret the data for you, uh, th that he had saw people who had been traumatic issues that had upper neck problems. So he would send those to me. And through the years, I developed various methods to treat these patients, right? So, for instance, uh, upper cervical facet injections. Uh, most doctors wouldn't do them, but I had a lot of patients who had a need for them because they had upper cervical problems sent by this Dr. Jacobson. So I started developing and honing those skills. And so I kind of got into this backwards because I had a lot of patients in my practice that had upper neck problems due to Dr. Jacobson. Now, he's since passed away. He was a great guy. Um, and then as we did more regen medicine, obviously, the next question was, how do we help this specific patient population with regen med or interventional orthobiologics? And that, that really required doing things very, very differently. And, um, you know, that's, that's all described in that book. 
Uh, Ulysses, I did steroids for set injections, block branch, and did PRF injections. I think you're talking about pulse radio frequency if it was covered by your insurance. Um, or maybe ablative radio frequency, RFA, RFA radio frequency ablation. Um, so it, uh, again, um, the, the problem, if it's radio frequency ablation, is that radio frequency ablation kills the nerves that supply the muscles that help to stabilize your neck. So that would be going the opposite direction of stabilizing your neck if you've got instability. So definitely not a good combo with a person with neck instability because it, it would be contraindicated in that kind of patient. Thatchin, sorry, the question was how this thing called the lanoaxial dislocation of value of images, what does it mean? Yeah, I, I would be a little careful with that because you have to realize that to traditional medicine, an lanoaxial dislocation is a surgical emergency that requires immediate uh, neurosurgery on the neck. Um, now, if what you mean is that C1 and C2 tend to like to rotate on each other, then I've covered that in the blog before um, as to why that happens due to lax neck ligaments. Um, and I'll see if I can pull it up here so you can read that. Hold on a second here. Let's see what I can get. Here we go. That looks like the right one. Okay, let me share my screen for that. Faction. Okay, so this blog is the one you'd want to read. Um, and the title is Why the C1C2 Facet Joint is Inherently Unstable. So if you go to the regenix.com site and you just type in um, C1C2 unstable, it'll probably come up. Um, it just talks about how it's a biconcave joint. Um, so you see, unlike a ball and socket joint, where you have a ball fitting into a socket, which is inherently stable, uh, C1C2 is biconcave, meaning concave on concave. So because of that, if the ligaments or muscles don't control it, one is going to slide forward or one joint surface is going to slide forward on the other which is going to cause that rotation. So that's a good one for you to read uh, on that topic, why the C1-C2 facet joint is inherently unstable. Pia, what nerve is likely irritated from CCI when pain goes into the jaw and face? So into the face could be cranial nerve five or trigeminal, <coughs> excuse me, neurology. We have a lot of patients that have that issue. Um, now, be a little careful with the jaw because it doesn't have to be a nerve with the jaw. Uh, that can just be good old fashioned TMJ, which is pretty common in CCI patients. Uh, so <coughs> definitely want to differentiate between those two. Alicia, I'm from New York City. I've been suffering with these symptoms since February this year. And neck pain in July and low back pain. Gotcha. Uh, Elissi did physical therapy and upper cervical chiropractor with relief, but the next step need to do regen injections like prolotherapy. Um, again, just realize that there's no one in New York City I know of that has any expertise in upper cervical spine uh, treatment. So um, I don't think you're going to find anyone there who's going to be able to help you. Now, if what you're trying to do is to see if just simple neck prolotherapy of these posterior ligaments helps. And that's a reasonable thing to do uh, with an experienced provider, then that's certainly worth a try one or two times to see if it if it makes a difference, removes the needle for you. If it doesn't, it doesn't I wouldn't waste my money um, in trying to find doctors to treat the upper neck because that's a, an extremely uh, specialized area. Robert, is normal neck movement okay to do post injections? If I'm resting, sleeping, I still feel the looseness in one area. Um, yeah, Robert. So it's certainly a couple different things might be possible there. Um, as far as normal activity, that's fine. Um, as far as the looseness in the C1 area, 
um, that may require something like PICL to really get on top of that rather than just posterior injections. Uh, Sharon, uh, do you see any difference in results in patients who got aligned by AO prior to injections versus patients who didn't? Not really, but I will say that for those of our patients who come in who uh, can uh, who get really benefit from AO care, in general, my overall thought is they tend to do a little bit better because it, number one, helps us realize that, that uh, correcting that instability is probably helpful. We also get very helpful feedback from the AO doctors telling us how long they're staying in place. Uh, Diana, is red light therapy okay post-PRP? That is just fine. Sheila is wearing cervical collar while waiting diagnosis and treatment appropriate if it relieves symptoms while on. Yeah, but as I always say, it's a two-edged sword. So just be careful there, meaning you don't want to be in a situation where you um, make the muscles weak. So you can wear it on an intermittent basis, but as soon as you start making the neck muscles weak, we then have two problems. One being the ligament instability and the other being weak muscles causing instability. So it's a two-edged sword, so just be careful. Uh, Ulysses, tell me a spine surgeon referred to a neurologist. Yeah, your spine surgeons and, and uh, upper cervical or neurologists are going to have no idea what's wrong with you. Um, uh, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, a spine surgeon in New Jersey, Dr. Bolognese, who knows about this stuff but his solution is more likely than not going to be a big upper cervical fusion that you may or may not require at this point. But as far as the average spine surgeon and neurologist, they're not going to have a clue what's wrong with you. Stacy, any specific spot you like to inject for C1C2 rotating opposite directions? Uh, mostly just to treat the irritated joint. Uh, it's usually irritated and to treat the ligaments that help stabilize C1C2. So that would be everything from the AO ligaments to the VDL back here to uh, ALAR uh, accessory ligaments that we just have discussed here. Kevin, what type of injections help bulging discs? Are they repairable through GEMED or descent to management until surgery is required? Um, bulging discs generally don't need to be treated directly, meaning um, if you get whole functional spinal unit type treatment, um, Patients with bulging discs do well and return back to the activities they want to return back to. Um, as far as surgery for bulging discs, that's usually a bad idea, although there are some patients that require it uh, because that will further destroy the disc and then increase the likelihood that the disc will re-herniate at some point. And the research on surgery right now show it's no better than having no surgery by one year. Um, so probably not a good idea to have surgery on a bulging disc, nor is it necessary 90% of the time. Ulysses, does sleeping bad cause CCI a lot? No. Sharon, uh, do you always recommend to get an MRV, MRI, or CTA? No, Sharon, no need to do that. Um, not unless there's something that we suspect with a vertebral artery dissection, in which case we would. But um, there wouldn't be any need to get that kind of imaging prior to injecting zero one. Uh, what you would need is, number one, the experience of having done it hundreds and hundreds of times. Number two would be a, um, a fluoroscope with um, digital subtraction and geography to do that safely. Lissy, I don't know if the brainstem is compressed. Uh, that could be seen on a routine neck MRI. Robert, uh, when do you others, when you or others come to learn new fact or better way in PRP treatment, do all the offering regent come to learn these? Not sure what you mean there. Um, so for example, uh, our team has been looking at the influence of dose on, or PRP dose, on cells and culture, shoot, going back to 2005. It's been very clear to us that dose makes a tremendous difference in patients with any age. Doesn't really make a difference if you're 20, but if you're 40, 45, 50, it makes a huge difference in how your cells respond. Um, so here we are, what? We're in 2022, some 17 years later. We've been, ba ba we've been banging that drum for 17 years. I've been banging it. 
And here we are, and still, I would say 70 to 80% of PRP injections are, are too low dose. Now, the good news is sometimes they still work when they're low dose, so that's great, uh, depending on the patient. But uh, have most doctors offering PRP made the switch? Uh, they haven't because there's other factors that, that cause them to use a certain PRP system over the other, not the least of which is how good looking the rep is. And what I mean by that is that, you know, we have a medical sales system where we have reps that come in and sell things. So those reps, you know, give doctors gifts. They hand out dinners, you know, uh, if they're uh, a lot of times, whether they're male or female, they look like they could win a beauty contest when they come into your office and the companies figure out pretty quickly that those kind of people get a, get more attention than hiring a, a rep that's not real pretty uh, or good to look at. So there's lots and lots of decisions in why a doctor chooses system A, which can't really concentrate that much versus system B, which can. Um, and now the good news is there's some doctors out there who aren't focused on that. They're focused on doing what's best for their patient, but regrettably, that's kind of the minority in my clinical experience. Sharon, can the PRP procedure knock out your alignment again? Uh, which PRP procedure? Certainly any procedure you get where you're put to sleep um, and just moved around can knock out your alignment. So, so it's always good if you have a good relationship with an AO or NUCA chiropractor to have that option available right after a procedure. Uh, Dana, can PRP sometimes cause some patients not to be able to hold their AO adjustments anymore? I haven't really seen that, but what you could be describing is someone who had a lot of inflammation in a joint and that inflammation was helping to stabilize that level. And now the inflammation we take away because of the PRP and all of a sudden that, that person becomes more subjectively unstable. Uh, Mikey Vin, I have HEDS and believe CCI. I've had bouts of recently feeling like I'm going to pass out and confusion while speaking. What condition secondary to CCI may cause this? Uh, it's not uncommon in um, CCI patients. I think I did a Facebook Live on it, Mikey, just two or three times ago. So you may want to look that one up. Um, confusion while speaking, again, is not uncommon. Um, and why does that happen? That can be everything from irritation of the vertebral artery, which supplies blood to the back of the brain, to position sense or proprioceptive, <coughs> excuse me, confusion, to impacts on cranial nerves. Uh, Ulysses, every time I move eyebrows up and down, I always feel, or eyebrows up and down, always feel a pressure or something. Um, yeah, let's see, not sure what's going on there. Um, Sharon, is PSL always necessary? Can CACS and be solved by just PRP? Yeah, Sharon, what I generally tell patients is about one in five that start with uh, posterior PRP the way we're doing it. We're not talking about the way it's normally done out there, just sort of hitting the ligaments, but actually hitting the upper neck joints under fluoroscopic guidance with contrast. Uh, about one in five CCI patients won't go forward to need a PICL. About four and five uh, still will need a PICL. Fetchin, with instability, do C1, C2 move in counter rotation or the same direction mostly? Usually counter rotation. Sharon, can swelling from PRP cause more IJV compression? Not quite sure how that would work if you're talking about posterior PRP. There wouldn't really be any communication there. Um, between those two things. Um, so unlikely that one's gonna cause the other. Ulysses, which I talk about PRF, I'm talking about plate rich fiber and then on the other side of my neck was covered by my insurance. Uh, yeah, Ulysses, be really careful because uh, plate rich fibrin or any platelet stuff is generally not covered by insurance. Now, if you had workers comp insurance, maybe it might be covered or sometimes auto insurance policies but just realize that if they build it incorrectly and they got paid for it, and at some point the insurance company finds that incorrect billing, i.e. we reimburse something we shouldn't have, then in most providers' offices, you've signed a document that makes it your financial responsibility 
if they have to refund the money. Um, so be very, very careful um, because getting the insurance slot machine to pay out is pretty easy by using the wrong codes. But if they use the wrong codes and get caught using the wrong codes, it's generally your financial responsibility. So just letting you know that that normally wouldn't be covered unless it was a workers' comp claim and specifically approved or an auto insurance claim and specifically approved. And if they got it covered by your group health insurance, it's more likely than not fraud um, that got it covered. Megan, do patients get put to sleep during PRP and PICI procedure clinic? Uh, yes, they do. Uh, now, uh, during certain posterior PRP procedures, they can opt to stay awake. Uh, during upper cervical ones, not. And during the PICL, not. Donna, when's your next vacation break? I need stem cell and PRP tune up. Uh, you know, Donna, I really don't go out on vacation other than the intermittent things for Christmas because of the holiday um, until May 1st. Um, so I'm here till May 1st. So it shouldn't be, we should be able to get you in at some point. Um, uh, Ulysses does play that rich five and works for cervical spine and other parts of the body. Yeah, I think you may be confusing platelet-rich fibrin with platelet-rich plasma, meaning platelet-rich fibrin means that there's already a clot and it's a surgical thing. Um, uh, platelet-rich plasma, sometimes after it's injected, will be clotted using calcium chloride. So maybe someone is calling that platelet-rich fibrin. Um, so I'm not quite sure what it is you're referencing there. Does platelet-rich plasma work in the cervical spine and other parts of the body? It can, but it depends on how it's deployed, what its concentration is, um, et cetera, et cetera, just as we've been discussing. Okay, guys, it's 2.07 p.m. my time, so 7 past the hour. So that means we've been at this for an hour and seven minutes. Um, so I'm probably going to start uh, just taking my last couple questions. Uh, so if you've got any last-minute questions, Put them below what we've been talking about uh, today is telemedicine NPEs and the kind of things you might want to consider during a telemedicine NPE. Um, Sharon, do you use A2M? If so, what is it for? Um, A2M is an anti-inflammatory that blocks a pro-inflammatory molecule. Um, uh, what is it for? What do, how do we use it? We would use it, let's say, in someone's knee who uh, might respond well to PRP, and we might add in A2M to the PRP in order to try to help reduce the inflammatory response long-term within the joint. That's how we would use it. Uh, I am a Canadian from British Columbia. Have you had any people with BC been covered for PICL under their auto insurance, ICBC? Uh, we haven't, and ICBC, from what I recall, now this is a decade ago when I was lecturing in Canada and they were all talking about ICBC is kind of a nightmare to deal with. At least it was back then. Maybe they've changed. I don't know. So as far as getting it covered under ICBC, I think that would be pretty uncommon to happen based on what I was told about ICBC when I was lecturing in, uh, actually I was lecturing in, in British Columbia. Sure, Donna. Happy to, happy to see you. Uh, Ulysses, I did platelet fibrin, not PRP for my last neck. Yeah, again, platelet fibrin means that there's a clot that's placed surgically. So maybe someone called uh, PRP platelet-rich fibrin. Maybe they were trying to clot it after they injected it by using calcium chloride, but it was really just PRP, meaning uh, platelet-rich fibrin is a surgical thing, not injection. Uh, Rigolab, what can cause clicking sound of the thyroid cartilage in the up position beneath the hyoid and a visible slipping when turning head left and back? Um, yeah, so it's a good question. I mean, lots of different things could be irritating the thyroid car cartilage there. Um, so the kind of things that you would look for would be, first thing would be bone spurs in the front of the neck bones, um, in particular in that area. You could also look at active ultrasound in that area as the person was extending or look at a DMX. Uh, Ulysses, I don't see evidence about plate-rich fibrin. 
Yeah, because again, platelet-rich fibrin is a surgical thing. So if someone told you they did platelet-rich fibrin, they really did platelet-rich plasma and they probably clotted it. Uh, Ulysses, uh, can SI joint be fixed with prolotherapy and get rid of left curved spine? Uh, if you've got SI joint instability, um, it generally responds well to prolotherapy, usually three to four treatments in men, uh, six or more in women. Um, as far as getting rid of a scoliosis, um, probably won't get rid of a scoliosis, but it can certainly help because remember the uh, rotation of the ilium can lead to turning of a lumbar spine and the scoliosis. Okay, guys, I'm going to shut this down. Uh, thanks so much for watching today. Um, I think I'll be here this Friday at one o'clock. So that's one o'clock uh, mountain. Uh, that's going to be uh, noon uh, Pacific and uh, two o'clock Eastern. So I will see you then. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day um, and asking all these great questions. Thank you.